Hello, class. We have just finished discussing um, how DNA is copied, um, both through copying the entire genome and also just um, it, genes during transcription and translation. And now we're going to move into what do we do with that information, right? Now that humans have the ability to understand this system, we can use it to our own advantage for both um, health reasons, forensic reasons, um, food supply, lots of different things that we can do with this biotechnology. So that is what we're going to talk about now. Um, so let me open up these slides for you guys. Oop, come on. Moving on. All right, here we go. So this chapter, we're going to be discussing um, all the ways that humans have started to use our knowledge of biology um, and kind of putting it together with our current technology. So we're going to discuss the polymerase chain reaction um, and then recombining pieces of DNA. So you may have heard of recombinant DNA. We'll talk about genetically genetic engineering and genetically modified organisms and then also biotechnology and human health. So what are we, how can we use this, all of this knowledge and technology for, um, for our healthcare system? Um, so first of all, um, when I'm using the term biotechnology, that's just, you know, using our understanding of everything that you've learned and other things um, to modify genes and cells um, for our own benefit. So it could be for the food supply or for our health. It could be for lots of different reasons. And then when we talk about genetic engineering, that's taking the genes of an organism and you can add or delete or move things from one organism to another. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about genetic engineering. So um, on this slide, we have pictures of um, like cloned cats and cloned other cloned animals. Um, you can do it for medical use, but also for endangered species to try to increase population sizes. So the polymerase chain reaction is the first thing that we're going to talk about. And this is something that we're actually going to be doing in lab as well. So this is a technique that's used to copy one little section of DNA millions of times. And you've heard of this because um, the PCR tests for COVID are those tests that take a little bit longer. Um, and that's just because it's not just a presence or absence of something. They're actually making copies, right? They are looking to see if you have that COVID um, protein in you which means you've been infected and then in, and then multiplying it enough that we could see it, not in, in any way that's dangerous, but just like kind of zooming in and making enough copies that we can see. So this is a technique that um, just makes copies of a section of DNA. Um, and so if there's nothing there, it can't make copies of it. And if that DNA is there, you can make copies and see it. Um, so it can be used to identify crime scene suspects, um, right? You can take a tiny little swab of DNA from a, a crime scene and make enough copies of it so you can match it to a person. Um, for paternity analysis, this is used um, to identify individuals, either within a human population, like for paternity and crimes, but also an endangered species to say, like, how many different, if you're collecting, like, poop samples from somewhere, like, how many different elephants do we have here? How many foxes are in this population? Um, and then we can also use it um, to confirm whether someone has a disease, right? Um, just like with those, those COVID tests. So this is just showing you, you know, an example and kind of explaining um, what a recombinant DNA and transgenic organisms are. So PCR is a tool that we can use to make copies of DNA um, just to kind of look at and visualize. But recombining DNA and creating a transgenic organism is something different. So recombining DNA or recombinant DNA is combining um, pieces of DNA that didn't start off together to make something new out of them, right? So you could take... Um, pieces that are from the same organism and just kind of switch their order, or you could take pieces from different organisms and put them together. And then if you're creating a transgenic organism, this is just an organism that has genes from a different organism. So here you've got mice that look like they're glowing in the dark, and this is because a fluorescent protein that um, jellyfish actually has has been added to them. And it's not just to make them spooky, but if they're, let's say they're trying to add a different gene, and then they add the 
glowing gene also. And then if the glowing gene is working, they can assume the other gene must have gotten in too, right? It's kind of a making, it's like testing out to make sure that their experiment worked. So what's the point of all this, right? It's not just to make glowing mice, but this can be used to insert genes that you want into organisms. And that's what's called the genetically modified organism. Um, and everyone's heard of GMOs probably in like the food supply. And you may see signs like no GMO foods here. Um, but what does that mean? And is that actually dangerous? Do you need to avoid GMOs? So when we talk about a GMO, those genes that were put into something or maybe a gene that was removed, those could be to change the growth rate to make something faster growing. So instead of getting one crop of corn in a season, maybe you can get two and feed more people. Um, nutritional content could be improved. So um, it's been the very first GMO was actually to include a vitamin um, in rice that doesn't normally occur in rice, but in an area that had malnourishment. So can we get more vitamins into our food? It could be to resist diseases. Um, it could be to drought resistance. So as climate change becomes a bigger issue um, and some places are drier and some places are wetter, um, we can start um, modifying the food so that places that maybe are having difficulty meeting their food needs are able to. Um, it is cheaper and quicker and more effective than traditional like crossbreeding of species um, or of different types of, you know, different varieties of the same food. Um, just because you can say this is the gene I want, I'm going to plop it right in there. And that's harder to do, um, you know, when you're when you're just breeding organisms. This way you can be very precise. Um, and clones of transgenic organisms have also been used to create um, large quantities of things like vaccines or antibiotics. So if you are able to put a gene into like a bacteria that breeds very quickly, right? They can just keep making that over and over and over and you can get really, really large um, quantities for people that is faster than it would be if you were trying to like grow them in a lab situation in other ways. So when we talk about genetic engineering, the actual biotechnology of picking a gene and plopping it into an organism um, is new. Right. That's only within the last few decades. But humans have been selecting for genes and, and traits and breeding organisms for thousands and thousands of years to try to get those traits out. So doing this genetic modification in a lab is just a faster way to modify crops. But it's not saying we've never modified crops before. This isn't a new concept. Um, so we've got here a picture of wild mustard. And mustard has been bred to create all these other foods. So cauliflower and broccoli are actually the same thing. Um, cabbage, kale, kohlrabi, and they all have, you may notice, kind of similar tastes. And that's because they actually were all developed from the exact same plant. And this was not genetic modification. This was just breeding. Um, and so it's a very similar process. It's just very slow, as you can imagine, if you wanted to start from scratch with mustard and get broccoli out of it. It would take you a long time. So what are some of the applications of GMOs? So what, you know, what is the purpose? What have people been using this for? So one thing it has been to incorporate a specific toxin into foods that um, only targets some insects. So it affects the, an insect growth. Um, it doesn't have effect on other types of insects. Um, so there are these specific receptors in a uh, kind of insect um, that if they feed on that crop, um, this will be a t will be toxic to them. And so it's really the pests of that crop. Um, but it does not have an effect on things like honeybees, um, which are just usually going for the pollen and nectar within a flower, and they're not eating the plant itself. Um, it doesn't have an effect on monarch butterflies, which don't feed on um, these crops. And has zero effect on the humans who are eating it because this is specific to like insect growth. Um, this is often added in corn plants. So when you hear that like uh, GMO corn is so common, that's because they've been putting this in so that they can use less pesticides, right? If they if they can keep the pests away in other ways. Um, so this has resulted in a decrease in pesticide use uh, because formerly they've been using this exact same toxin and spraying it on the plants and now it's growing in it. So they're not spraying it on every plant, right? It's not just getting into the wind and spraying on everything in a field and all of the other weeds and flowers that may be nearby. It's really just in this one, you know, just in the crop that you're growing. 
Um, so that um, incorporating that has resulted in a decrease in pesticide use. So pesticides affect usually like insects. Um, there are also um, plants that are resistant to herbicides. So they've added something so that you could spray something on them that usually would kill weeds and it won't kill your plants that have this. Um, so if you've heard of Roundup Ready crops, those farmers could just spray the whole field with this herbicide chemical um, and, and their crops wouldn't die, but everything else would. This actually resulted in a huge increase in herbicide use and herbicide is a poison, right? So this was resulting in an increase in all of this poison being put out there, um, but the farmer's crops would stay still growing. Um, and then in animals, an example has been this fast growing salmon. So they've taken a growth hormone from a fish that grows much faster and um, the salmon grows faster this way. So for farmed salmon, this enables them to get um, more salmon in a short amount of time. Um, a danger of this is that it could, you know, potentially escape to a wild population if that salmon um, breeds with other um, fish. Um, GMOs can be really, really beneficial. Um, so as I had said earlier, one of the first GMOs ever developed was um, in increasing nutrition in a plant. So this is golden rice. This was developed by a nonprofit, not a big corporation, um, to include vitamin A in populations where rice is one of their main foods. Um, so this was a gene that was inserted. It's a natural gene that is also found in like squash and carrots. Um, the actual one they took was from a daffodil. It was just easier to pick up and move, but it's the exact same gene. Um, and so now one bowl of rice provides 60% of their daily allowance of vitamin A. Um, without vitamin A, people can um, suffer like horrible diseases and it, it results in blindness and it can be very painful. So this is something that's really life-saving. Um, they have um, moved genes into plants so that they can withstand drought in areas that aren't, aren't getting as much rain or have kind of depleted some of their water supply. Um, plants that can grow in saltier waters for places where once they deplete their water supply, sometimes salt water from the sea can kind of seep into their um, groundwater. So things that can grow in saltier areas, um, providing iron, using nitrogen more efficiently because plants take a lot of nitrogen out of the soil. So instead of having to like mine for nitrogen and um, and apply that to the soil if they can get plants that don't need as much, um, that's beneficial. They've also um, genetically modified mosquitoes so that they pass along a lethal gene to their own offsprings to decrease mosquito populations, which decreases a lot of disease spread. So there are some really beneficial things that can be done um, with GMOs. So we're just gonna talk a little bit about those. Um, First of all, we talked about how that toxin, that Bt toxin can be added into plants, specifically corn plants. So if we look here on this chart in the green, you can see the amount of corn that has been grown um, in the United States from like the you know mid 90s through 2014. And you can see we're growing a lot of corn, right? Um, this is a huge um, food product. We export it, we feed a lot of corn to livestock and we use it for um, like ethanol, things like that. Um, but in this blue, we can see how much insecticide has been used. Um, and we've vastly decreased our insecticide, which are these poisons that are put out um, and kill any insect. Um, and so we've decreased our insecticide use while we've increased our corn um, growth. Um, and this is because um, the BT corn, um, or I'm sorry, this green line is all BT corn. So um, all of this, as we've increased BT corn, this um, genetically modified corn, we've been able to decrease insecticide use. So we're killing only those target insects instead of kind of broadly killing um, every insect that kind of flies into the path, which could be some beneficial ones, right? Like honeybees and butterflies, um, some spiders, right? Things that weren't harming the crop were getting killed um, by these pesticides. But that isn't to say that every single GMO is good, right? So this is just like any technology. You can use it for good or you could use it in a way that's bad, right? So it's really not that all GMOs are good or all GMOs are bad. It's a gray zone and it depends what you're doing with that GMO. Why are you modifying it? So some drawbacks of GMOs 
are, first of all, we did say already that it could result in an increase in herbicide use. So herbicide is what you spray on the plants to kill weeds. Um, if the farmers aren't worried about their crop dying, they end up spraying more herbicides. They're not being as careful with it. Um, and there can be a resistance to this, um, right? Organisms can um, develop resistance and that can spread if, um, if those are the plants that are surviving. Um, beneficial weeds and native plants, things like that can be affected by the, that increased herbicide because it can kill um, other plants. Um, and obviously it's just chemicals, right? So even if you're not planning to kill other things with it, if it gets into your water, right? If we were to drink a gallon of herbicide, we would die. Um, so if it gets into the water supply, it gets into the ground and kind of leaches into water, um, it can be really dangerous to the environment. And I think um, within the past decade, um, certainly environmentalists have become very aware of the dangers of um, herbicides and these Roundup Ready plants and their, um, their numbers are decreasing significantly. Um, within the ones that um, the BT toxins in plants um, that are meant to um, target insects, those insects could develop resistance to them, right? Just like plants can become resistant to the herbicide, insects can become resistant to, as well. And so then they have to continually kind of tweak that gene, just like they, you'd have to tweak whatever chemicals you were putting on if you were just putting them right out on the plants. Um, insects that you're not specifically targeting, if they are eating that plant, not going for the pollen or the nectar, but if they're trying to eat that plant, they could be affected. So while it, they have tried to make it very limited and targeted, um, the scientists, when they're developing these, um, you know, you don't know every single insect that's going to come in contact with it. Um, there is a potential um, spread of genes to non, um, to organisms that you didn't want that gene to get into if they crossbreed, right? It's not that genes just like fly out there, right? Um, and if, you know, if a bird has a gene, it's not going to get into us. But if there's some sort of hybridization, um, which can happen, um, that's when those genes could spread. Um, as in the farming situation, as more and more farmers are using these specific crops, um, there could be loss of genetic diversity, right? It's, you know, they're not necessarily using the old like crop from 100 years ago and the different varieties of corn and tomatoes and things like that. And a lot of this gets back to them that those GMOs may be um, owned by large corporations. And so people are um, fearful of them or angry at them. And they're worried that all of that like knowledge and money is kind of getting um, consolidated in one place. And so some of the anger at GMOs is more the anger at these companies, but a lot of GMOs are actually developed by scientists in universities and they're more like nonprofits. So, um, you know, you shouldn't just assume that every single GMO is um, being owned by this large corporation and that that's, um, that you're benefiting them. And then finally, um, as we talked about how pesticide usage has decreased, um, the Roundup usage, which is an herbicide, has increased um, as these GMOs have increased. So, you know, pesticide use has gone down, but herbicide use has gone up. And so that's something that people really need to be aware of and that farmers, I think, are starting to take into more consideration. So we're going to stop here right now, and um, we will pick up with some other um, biotechnology in um, the next presentation.